Thank you for tuning in today. We're super excited you're here as we walk into today's conversation. Our prayer is that it would inspire you on your walk with God and support you in a weekly rhythm of connecting with Him. To access our full podcast library, visit HobokenGrace.com or our app. I haven't had the chance to meet you. My name's Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace, and we are in the midst of this conversation called Restoring Love. Now, I want to give this disclaimer before we go any further. I don't see any of them right now, but I do want to let you know if you have children in this service, there's this thing upstairs called Grace Kids, and you are going to want to take advantage of that today. I say that because whenever we walk through this conversation, at the end of it, someone comes to me and says, you should have told me. Well, consider yourself warned, okay? Right right now, we are in the midst of this conversation, Restoring Love, and if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know that we've been walking through these pillars that are essential to love, that love is built on. I believe God says relationships rest on these four pillars that we're going to be walking through. We've talked about two of them. Two of them that, honestly, we didn't necessarily expect that we would talk about in a relationship series. So two weeks ago, we talked about character and the significance of character as it pertains to love and relationships. And then last week, we talked about commitment and the significance of commitment. And as we've been walking through these, we've talked about the reality that if any of these pillars, and hopefully you've picked up on the fact that this is going to be true about all four of these as we work through them, if any of these pillars begins to decrease, or if any of these pillars don't increase, all of your relationships are going to fall to the lowest level, fall to the lowest pillar, if you will, are going to sink to that level. So if you have low character, all of your relationships are going to sink to the level of your character. If you're afraid of commitment, all of your relationships eventually, and it's true with all these eventually, some, some people might foolishly actually give you intimacy and might even commit to you when you have low character. But eventually, I promise you, it's a principle of life, all of your relationships are going to sink to that level. And so we're looking at... How do, we, how do we identify what those pillars are? And, and then how do, we, how do we begin to work in our own lives, not just in our relationships, but our own lives, to increase our character, increase our willingness to commit so that we can have a greater experience, so that we can love better. And through all of this, we're looking not just at what Jesus has taught us, because as we've said through this entire series, God doesn't teach us to love just by what he says. He teaches us to love by what he does. Let me take you back to that passage, 1 John 3, 16. We know what real love is. It's not a mystery. It's not a surprise. It's not hidden from us. We know it. Why? Because of the example that God has set for us. And Jesus doesn't want you to learn about love by watching him love someone else or reading a book about how he loves someone else. No, he wants for you to experience it yourself. And I bring us back to that again today because I want to reiterate for those of you who are here and you're just watching the way that he loves your friend or you're just watching the way that he loves your spouse. Or you're just watching the way that he loves the person that you're dating. You are missing out on what he has for you. And he wants to invite you into that relationship with him as well. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, Jesus gave his life so that you could experience his love, not just read about it. And we've seen how he's done that with character. We've seen how he does that with commitment. And today we're going to continue and we're going to move on to the third pillar. Now, as we come to the third pillar, we're going to talk about things that we typically talk about when it pertains to relationships. Again, not a lot of us talk about character, and eventually we talk about commitment, but it's not necessarily part of the, the conversation at the beginning. But, but then as we come to today in the pillar that we want to explore today, we're going to talk about more of what we frequently talk about as it pertains to love and relationships. The one that we're going to talk about today, this pillar actually could be divided into four different pillars, but then it becomes a lot of pillars. So we brought them together. And even when Jesus teaches us about this, he actually talks about it in terms of one thing, and he talks about them together. And so I want to be able to walk through them together as well. There's actually a point where Jesus specifically teaches that this is part of love, and he does it 
by calling us to love him this way. He says, this is how I want for you to love me. It's one of the most famous passages where God talks about us loving him. It's all throughout scripture. As a matter of fact, it's found in Deuteronomy 6, Matthew 22, Luke 10, and Mark 12. And so all throughout scripture, you see God calling us to this. Many of you have heard this before. It's called the great commandment. Jesus says you can take the whole Old Testament, all of the Jewish scriptures, and wrap them up into two things. The first is found in Mark chapter 12, 30. It says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then he continues and says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment. But today specifically, I want to look at how he calls us to love him. Because as God steps into our lives, not only does he say, I want for you to love me, but he specifically calls out how. And in doing so, in doing so, he calls out something that you understand about yourself, but maybe you've never understood about love. Because he comes in and says, I want you to love with all of these different aspects of who you are. Now, hopefully you understand this about yourself, that you have these different aspects to who you are these different dimensions, these different parts or or pieces of who you are. All of us understand we're more than just we're more than just physical beings. We understand that we're intellectual beings. There's these different aspects to who we are. And we, we don't just understand this because science has taught us this. We understand this because thousands of years ago, Jesus actually addressed this. And even thousands of more years before that, God addressed this with the nation of Israel. He says, you need to understand that there's more to you than just the physical. There's these different aspects to who you are. And yet I want you to love me with all of them. I want you to love me holistically. I want you to bring all of these into the way that you engage me. Now, a really interesting thing is that when you go back to Deuteronomy and God's interaction with the nation of Israel, it doesn't include include this one. It's Jesus who actually includes this one. It's interesting that this is added after God becomes flesh. Very interesting. But God says, I want for you to, to holistically love me. But he doesn't just teach us that this is significant in love. He also demonstrates it. And so Jesus steps into our lives, and he doesn't just say, this is how I want for you to love me. This is how he loves us. And so Jesus steps into our story, and one of the things that you see is that he engages us emotionally. So you need to understand that this is part of how you love, that you love, you love em- with your emotion. And I, some of you, you love emotionally very easily. Others of you are very stoic, and you wish the world had less emotion. The rest of us wish the world had less of you. And, but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love you. I'm actually in that box usually. But God says, no, you love with your emotion. You love with the soul, your soul. That's the core of who you are. You're a your, your spiritual being. You need to love with the core of who you are, your mind, your, the way that you engage the world, the way that you understand the world. I want for you to love that way. I want you to love with your strength, to love physically. And Jesus steps in and he does all of these, beginning with loving with his heart. Let me take you to... One of the places where we see this being lived out, Luke chapter 19, verse 41 says this. It says, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. He's looking out over the city of Jerusalem, and and he's longing for them to know why it is that he's there and the way that he loves them. But he realizes how lost they are in the direction that they're headed in, and it, it literally makes him weep. And you see his heart for these people. You see his heart for this situation. As it continues, it says, How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes and it breaks his heart. Another place where you see this is at the passing of Lazarus. It says this, it says, when Jesus saw her, talking about his friend, weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, 
A deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? Talking about Lazarus, his friend who had died, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. And you see his heart. Now you say, why is this significant? This is far more significant than most of us realize because here's something that I know about most of you. Most of you think that God is void of emotion. You think that God is a being without emotion, and that is a massive mistake. That is a massive mistake. The reason that you experience emotion is because you were created in the image of God. And God experiences emotion. And throughout Scripture, you hear him calling us to the reality that God, God doesn't engage us void of emotion. No, he's, he experiences emotion. And he passionately loves us. And so throughout Scripture, you see it talking about God's emotion towards us. And you see it talking about jealousy. And you see it talking about excitement. And you see it talking about love. And you see it talking about passion. All of these are emotions. And God says, no, no, I, I don't love love you void of emotion. I love you with emotion. I engage you that way. And this is so important because so many of you, you go through difficult things and you think you're going through them alone and you think God knows about it, but God doesn't actually feel it. And that is a massive mistake. God feels all of it. He loves you with his heart. He does not keep that separate you cannot possibly fathom the amount of pain that God feels on an ongoing basis. Because he doesn't just feel your pain and your pain. He feels all of it. He engages it with his heart. No, I'm, I'm, emotion, I'm emotional about you. He brings his emotions to how he loves us. You see Jesus living this out, demonstrating it. So now love is when you love someone with your heart. But it's not, just, it's not just that. You also see him loving with his soul. John 12, 27. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. This is actually Jesus in the garden right before he goes to the cross. And as he's praying in the garden, he says his soul is crushed. Do you know why his soul is crushed as he's in this moment? It's because he knows what's going to happen to his soul. You see, the reality is that when Jesus takes on our sin and gives his life on that cross, the scriptures teach that he actually enters into hell on our behalf. And he knows what's about to happen to his soul. And so he's not worried about what's physically about to happen. He's worried about what's going to happen spiritually, what he's about to spiritually engage. He says, no, I'm going to love them with my soul. And he brings this aspect of who he is. He doesn't just teach us to love this way. He teaches he demonstrates this in the way that he loves us. Continuing mind, for many of us, and this is, this is unfortunate, but for many of us, we think that, well, if you're going to pursue God, you have to leave your mind behind. And maybe you had a professor who told you that. Well, God actually says, no, I want you to love me with your mind. Bring your mind. Bring your intellect. God's not afraid of your questions. He says, I want you to love me with your, with your mind. And then when Jesus steps on the scene, you see him constantly engaging people intellectually and trying to change the way that they see the world and the way that they understand the world. He says this all the time, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Here's another story Jesus told the kingdom of heaven is like. He says this time after time after time. What is he trying to do? He's trying to help them understand. You see the world one way, but it's actually backward. The kingdom of heaven, this world is actually like this. And, and you have to understand God's actually like this. And God actually loves in a different way than you think. And God has created love to be something different than, than you think. All of it is engaging our mind. As a matter of fact, Romans says that one of the things that, that God's doing in our lives to help us become more and more like him is the transformation of our minds. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. He wants to engage the way that you 
think. He says, no, no, I'm going to engage your mind. And so you see Jesus is not just teaching us this. He's demonstrating this. He loves with his heart. He loves with his soul. He loves with his mind. And then obviously, we know how he loves physically. As he goes to that cross. And you go back to this passage in 1 John. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. And you see the way that he so powerfully loves us with his physical being. And God says, you have to understand, to love is to bring all of you into a relationship. And if you're going to love well, well, it means that you need to love with all of who you are, not just part of part of who you are, but all of who you are. Now, now, there's different ways that we typically talk about this, and so some of us talk about this in terms of connection. I, I talk about this historically in terms of chemistry, this idea of con- chemistry that we're connecting with one another. And I think that as God is calling us to this, we have to understand that, no, no, if we're going to love someone, we have to connect on all these different levels, and we have to bring all of this to a relationship. Now, I will, I will say this, that I used to hate this word chemistry, I, I despised it because of the fact that most of the time, I was working with college students at the time, and, and someone would come to me and say, well, you know, we have, I, I met so-and-so, and, and we have such great chemistry. And I would say, well, what do you mean by the fact that you have chemistry? And they say, well, we both like pepperoni pizza. And I said, well, please don't build a relationship on that. I hope that you don't think that that's actually significant. And so I used to oftentimes mock chemistry. But, but then my wife actually talked to me about this. And, and I'll be honest with you, as we're walking through this series and talking about love, most of what I'm teaching you I learned from my wife. And, and, and so I, my wife began to talk to me about this in a different way. And she said, well, what if, what if, what if chemistry actually applies to all of who we are? And, and, and what, if, what if there's actual, what if there's such a thing as physical chemistry and intellectual chemistry and spiritual chemistry? And all of a sudden, I began to see it in an entirely different, different way. And realizing that there's, there's actually more significance to it than just these little things that sometimes are trivial that will build relationships around and let me, let me say one other thing here, because I said it in the first service, and my dinner groups person said I have to be consistent in all the services, otherwise it gets really confusing in groups. And it, but for those of you who are like, oh, we have, we have great chemistry, and we like the same pizza, and, and then you know, the other thing that you'll tell people is that you knew from the day that you met them. And some of you say that to other people, and you say, well, you know, I, from the day that I met them, I knew that, we, that this was the right one. Would you please stop saying that to people? It's really, really destructive. Because one, the day that you met them, you didn't know if they had any demonstrated character. You had no idea about their commitment. And for those of you who are hearing that, because this is what happens, the, the people who listen to you, they don't think, man, that's a miracle. They look at it and say, well, I, that's how life works, and so I have to wait till I meet that one that I know on day one. For those of you who are listening and you think that, you need to understand something about the person who's telling you that. Because I had a sister who does this as well. You need to understand that that happened with all 11 people that they dated. And all 11 people were the right one on day one until they weren't later on. And as long as you maintain that, eventually you will meet the right one on day one. But it's destructive Sometimes the way that we think about chemistry is destructive. But God steps in and says, no, no, I, I, I want to reshape this for you. Now, now, there are certain ones of these that we spend a lot of time on and that we focus on inside of, inside of our culture. And so oftentimes we'll talk about whether or not we have emotional chemistry and whether or not we connect emotionally and whether, whether we... We feel like we love one another. Oftentimes is what we talk about when it's love, when we have emotional chemistry. We'll also oftentimes talk about physical chemistry and whether or not we're attracted to one another. Intellectual chemistry is a lot lower on the table. And then spiritual chemistry is something that for many of us is a brand new idea. But God says, wait, 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 you need to understand 
If you're going to love, you have to bring all of you to the table And you have to love with all of you. And I don't want you to love me with part of you. I want you to love me with all of you. And I'm going to love you with all of me. And this is what it looks like. And throughout this series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at this example and looking at, okay, how does he love us? But then we've been building on that and and asking, well, then how does that impact how we love the people around us? Because God doesn't just want us to be loved by him. He wants for us to be able to show that to the world around us. And I think when you, when you look at this pillar, it has so much to say about how we engage love and, and how we love those around us. Beginning with probably the one that we talk about the most, or at least our culture talks about the most, and that is this idea of of physical love and, and whether or not we have physical chemistry and how do we love one another physically. And I know that as we work through this series, and I've said it from the beginning, some of you, as we move through this, you're only going to think about this in terms of romantic relationships, and you're only going to think about this in terms of, of dating relationships, but it's more than that. You can, to be able to love one another physically means that you're willing to actually engage serving the other person with your physical being. You say, well, what does that have to do with friendship? Well, all of us have that friend that always opts out when we're moving. They're not actually willing to serve someone else physically. And you say, well, that's not that significant. Well, maybe it is. And maybe if you're looking at who it is that you're going to spend your life with, you should watch out for that. And whether or not they're actually willing to serve someone else physically One of the things that happens every time that my wife gets home with groceries is that I want my boys downstairs helping her carry them up. Why? Because I want them to learn to serve someone else physically. It's actually significant. And if we're going to love well, we have to bring all of ourselves to the table One of the things that sometimes happens here at Hoboken Grace, it's kind of funny, is that someone will come and they'll begin attending for the first couple weeks and they'll come up to me and they'll say, hey, listen, if you ever need someone to speak, I can fill in. I think, wow. Yeah, we'll just throw you up there. (laughs) Every time that happens, I say, well, you know, maybe not, but... We do have room on our setup team if you'd like to come and set up chairs. And they say, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't really think that, I'm, that that's for me. Then you're probably not for us. Are you willing to serve physically? And this is, this is significant. It's even significant in the way that we, that we talk about Sex, and I know whenever we start talking about physical, it, it all becomes about sex, but we so misunderstand this when it, comes, when it comes to sex. One of the things that I often say that makes people very uncomfortable is that I think that Jesus would have been very good at sex. And you say, well, how would you know that? <laughs> well, here's why. I had a conversation with a friend of mine several years ago, and he was dating someone, and they were getting closer and we were talking, and he said, you know, I feel like we have to sleep together. We've got to find out if we're going to be sexually compatible. And this is a big idea inside of our culture. I, I said, well, what makes you think that? He said, well, you know, everyone, everyone knows that. I said, well, yeah, you can read that in Cosmopolitan, but what else makes you think that? So we just got to know. I mean, you don't want to get married and not be sexually compatible. I said, well, you understand that there's severe flaws in logic in that, and that displays a pretty pretty intense misunderstanding of biology because you understand, right, that your body's not going to stay the same. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> one, of the things I, one of the things I tell my class in premarital classes, you need to understand something, and this is true for most of us in here. Some of us, some of, just a few of you are young enough where it isn't true of you yet, but for almost all of us, 
Like, we're all going downhill from here. <laughs> all of you. Me too. I'm still the younger one who has a little bit more to go, but you, you definitely. <laughs> but I said, you have to understand your body's going to change, and you have no idea what's going to happen inside of a relationship. When Anna and I first got married, shortly after we got married, she developed something called endometriosis. It makes sex incredibly painful. And all of a sudden, it changed. You don't know what's going to happen. In that premarital class I talk, I talk about the fact that sometimes in a relationship, sex is going to be off the table. And the guys are like, whoa, wait, 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 what are you, what are you talking about? Sex is going to be off the table. I said, well, you just if she, even if she just gets pregnant, sex is probably going to be off the table. And they're like, oh, maybe for the last couple of weeks of the pregnancy. And I said, whoa, whoa, you, it's not the pregnancy you have to worry about. It's after the pregnancy that's actually going to be longer. And they're like, what? And they start to sweat. And it gets very uncomfortable. But I said to my friend, the, the biggest question is not whether or not you're sexually compatible in this moment. The biggest question is whether or not you each have the character to forego, to forego your own physical pleasure in order to be able to love the other person. And whether or not that person's going to love you even when sex isn't on the table. And do you, can you find someone who, who loves you enough to forego their own physical pleasure in order to serve you. Well, that's something significant. And if you find someone like that, let me tell you something. You won't have to worry about sex. And that's why I think Jesus would be good at sex, because he always served the other person. I remember the night that I got married, we were walking out of, we were walking out of the reception my wife hates it when I tell this story. <laughs> we were walking out, and my uncle comes up to me. And my, my uncle's a huge human being. He's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and he's built like a linebacker. And he wraps his arms around me as I'm leaving, and I'm expecting to say, congratulations. He wraps his arms around me. I'll never forget it because he bent over. And he whispers in my ear. He says, you make sure she climaxes first. That's exactly how I responded. <laughs> I was like, what? This is not a conversation to have with my uncle. But you know what he wanted me to learn? Sex is about serving. It's about serving. There's this passage in, in 1 Corinthians. Br bring that up. Where God steps into our, wives, our lives and says this. He says, the wife does not have authority over her own, own body. Don't freak out yet. It, he goes both ways. But yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Just before this, he talks about the responsibility that we have to be able to engage one another. And, and then he continues. And he says, do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to Prayer, he says, I want for you, as you engage in this relationship, I want for you to use sex as a way to serve. This is not about your own pleasure. This is not about what you want. This is not about your drive. This is about how you serve the other person. And I want you, I want you to love each other physically. But this is not something that you take from someone. This is something that you give to someone. And he actually says, don't deprive each other of this. Except for, and I know some of you are like, except for, he says except for, for a time. Yeah, he does say that, but he says that there's a reason. And I'm betting that none of you are like, you know what? We need to spend a lot more time in devoted prayer, so let's take a break. <laughs> I'm betting that's not happening. What's he trying to teach us? Sex is about what you give. It's about what you give. And you want to be able to love one another well physically? Find someone and devote in yourself. Devote in yourself. I don't know. 
This is not going to be about my pleasure. This is about how I serve the other person, including the time in my life where I'm going to say, no, 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 I'm going to abstain from my own pleasure in order to serve them, in order to love them well, because God has taught us, as we talked about last week, when it comes to commitment, that commitment needs to be tied to intimacy. Commitment needs to be tied to physical chemistry. And if you're in a relationship and you're asking the other person to increase their physical chemistry without increasing commitment, you are not loving them well. You are putting them in danger. Which is why God says, no, don't sleep together until you're married. He's not trying to withhold on you. He's not trying to steal from you. He wants to develop in you something that's crucial if you're going to physically love well. And he wants you to understand how love works. So he steps in, he says, I want to change the way that you think about this whole thing. And, and let me just say this. Listen, listen, listen. Listen very carefully. Because some of you are here, and right now we're talking through this, and you're saying, Chris, that ship has sailed. And you're feeling guilty. This is one of the most amazing things about Jesus. Jesus steps into our lives, and he says, listen, I'm going to take all your mistakes and listen to me, none of, you are, none of us are in here without making mistakes. All of us have made mistakes. If you're here and you're feeling that guilt and you're saying, listen, I'm the one who made a mistake. No, no, all of us, we're all in this together. And Jesus steps into the lives of all of us who've made those mistakes. He says, listen, I've paid for those mistakes. I gave my life for those mistakes. My soul actually entered hell for those mistakes so that, listen to me, so that, so that we can engage the future honestly without carrying the weight and the guilt of the past. And so often in our lives, listen to me, because all of us do this, so often in our lives we will lie about the future because we don't want to admit the mistake in the past. And we will continue to engage the future under the authority of a lie because of the fact that we don't want to confront the guilt of our past. But God steps in and says, no, no, I'm taking care of the guilt of the past so that you can move honestly into the future. This isn't about what happened in the past. Tr give to Jesus your past. For someone who's in a relationship with Jesus, the only thing in a rearview mirror is a giant cross. That's the only thing there. Give to Jesus your past and allow him to move you honestly into the future. Don't continue to live in that lie and miss out on what he wants for you, on what he created you for, on what real love looks like. He wants to change the way that we think about how we physically love, about physical chemistry. But again, there, there's, more than just, there's more than just physical chemistry. There's also intellectual chemistry. And I think this impacts the way that we love as well. But I'm out of time, so to be continued. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the way that you love us. I thank you for how you so passionately do this in our lives. And I pray that today as we talk through this, that we, would, that we truly would trust, that we would embrace grace. Your grace that allows us to be honest about the past without carrying the weight of guilt, shame, so that we can move honestly into the future. Thank you. Thank you for how you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.